Okay, it's 4.15. You're late. Yeah. So are you. All late. Yeah. I don't think it works that way. So uh, my name is Mark Vaughn. How many of you in the room know me? That dude, because he was in the last session. One person knows me. I run our internal analytics and operations teams. Um, and Jeremy Morris, who's our speaker today, is a, is a member of, of my team. Um, excited to, to have you guys here from Jeremy. Um, yeah, okay. Excited to have you here from Jeremy. A quick introduction on him. He's been here with Domo for about six years. He uh, started out in our consulting group. I then stole him uh, for my team uh, because that's what smart managers do. They just find other smart people and, and pull them into their team while other people are not looking. So I did that. Um, and he's been with our team for, for multiple years now. Um, he uh, is, it manages our data science team. And, um, and, and if you saw the title of this session, How, How to Be Lazy, the, um, I don't know that I like that as his manager, but I guess that's that's how it works. But he's going to show you some pretty cool stuff. Uh, he'll end in time to do some q and I'll, I'll run the mic around for, for you guys. One thing I, I guess I mentioned, because we're a data-driven company, hopefully like all of you guys are, uh, we actually did a, a pre-conference survey. I'm curious, just by raise of hands, who, who filled out the pre-con survey? OK, so a decent number of people. Thank you for those that didn't. You guys suck. So. Um, but yeah, one, one of the things that we found in that survey is a couple of key points. One was most of, of the attendees, uh, they self-related as, um, as being more advanced in their use of Domo. And, and they wanted, and, and the other thing was a lot of people wanted some, some real tactical stuff. So Jeremy's, this session is a little bit more advanced and, and will give you a little bit more tactical stuff. So hopefully that's what you're looking for. So without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Jeremy Morse. Okay, how's everyone doing? Thank you for sticking with it today. It's getting late. Um, great, I was a little worried about the title of the presentation um, because I figured that Mark would see it at some point. But uh, I will spend a little bit of time talking about laziness um, because it, it, maybe it sounds weird, but it turns out that I'm a little passionate about the topic. Uh, and we will, you'll get that as, as we go through the first little bit of, of the presentation. Uh, one other comment, as Mark mentioned, um, you know, we know that attendees would like more advanced uh, content. And I had a goal of um, being the most advanced content that you will see at the conference. So if you want to spend, I'm going to guess, 20 minutes looking at Python code, then like you're in the right spot, OK? If you don't want to do that, um, I'm fine. You know, you're good. There's drinks outside. Are there, cookie, are there any cookies left? I didn't notice. Smoothies. OK. Um, let's get started. So um, as I mentioned, I do, uh, I would like to discuss laziness for a little while um, because I find it to be an interesting topic. Uh, this young man happens to have solved a problem that, that I often have, which is, you know, after a long day's work, then, then what happens, like, so you work really hard and then you go home and then, you know, if you're like me, you have multiple children and we actually a uh, dog, I got a dog recently, which has to apparently be walked every, twice a day. And so it's very hard, right? Life is very hard. And so at the end of the day, you would like to uh, maybe catch up on some YouTube or something, right? And if you're like me and you're tired, that means that you drop your phone on your face a couple of times. Yeah, all right, got a couple of people, okay? So this young man happens to have solved all of these issues, right? With a little bit of ingenuity. And what he's done is he is, like he took a little bit of time and he thought through the problem and he, he came up with a solution so that he could be lazy at some point in the future, right? So this is, I, I like to call it the lazy later principle, which is like, I'm gonna work super hard right now so that later on, you know, I'm good. I can just lay there and, and not have the, <laughs> the phone hit me in the face, okay? 
All right. Um, the other thing is uh, I like to think about life sometimes as a series of trade-offs. So uh, as do many uh, economists. If, if you've taken any um, economics classes like I did back in the day, you know that we, we love like uh, doing these trade-offs on, on two-dimensional grids, right? So what we can trade off is like we, we trade off between things that are interesting and things that are repetitive. And um, what we have is like we have in certain regions of this chart, things are more interesting more, excuse me, yeah, more interesting than they are repetitive, and, and then other things are more repetitive than they are interesting, right? And, and what I like to do is just think through, like, how, you know, how am I going to interact with this trade-off? So um, one thing is, like, you're probably going to want to automate anything in that other uh, region, right? These are things that we're just, if they're more repetitive than they are interesting, they're not really worth our time, right? This, uh, this is something like um, picking out what I'm going to wear in the morning, if there was a way to automate that, I would. Um, I understand that some people are now just wearing the same thing every day. I've seen that as like a thing. Uh, I'm not ready to do that right now, but anyway, there's also things that that are they're still more interesting than they are repetitive, but they don't quite meet like there's a minimum interesting threshold, and underneath that, you know, below that threshold, I'm just again not interested, right? So you see, like, this says make it someone else's problem. So, uh, for example, taking the garbage out, like, it's not terribly repetitive. It only happens once a week. So, you know, make the kids do it, right? Um, really, what we want to do, what I want to do, is spend most of my time in this ideal zone where things are above that interesting threshold and below some repetitive threshold so I don't feel like I'm just, like, stuck doing the same things over and over again, right? Um, and lastly, I think it's super unlikely that there's anything like real that would happen that would be in that region, right? Okay. So, uh, so what might be in the ideal zone? Um, these are things like, for me, like research questions, data storytelling. Mark mentioned, uh, you know, I'm a data scientist. I spent a lot of years in, uh, actually in the market research industry, and so it, those are the things that I find interesting are answering those research questions. Um, the you know, automating processes actually falls on the chart. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully Mark left. Um, anyway, the point is like automating processes is like on the chart because you actually get to think through something that's relatively complicated or even fairly complicated. Um, and therefore, um, you know, all analogies break down a little bit. But I like doing that work of, of thinking through those processes. So, um, and the, la the last thing that I'll talk about here is um, my. Uh, the man I sometimes consider my spiritual leader, um, Bob Dylan. So Bob Dylan is great. If you're a Dylan fan, like, like I, I've been a Dylan fan for, for a lot of years now, um, you know that he's incredibly uh, snarky and has very dry humor. Um, he's also very good at recognizing kind of the inherent um, ridiculousness of life. And um, in this song in particular, uh, he goes through, you know, he, he's listing uh, sort of these interactions that he's having with people and with the systems that, that those people have created and, and how he often feels like he's getting stuck in these loops, right? And uh, this line comes, I, I think, in the next to last uh, verse where, where he's just ruminating on this question, like, what does he have to do? What's the price that he pays to, to, get, out of, uh, to get out of those uh, repetitive situations? And I bring that up because I think that the price that we pay is, um, in the specific case, is like we learn some scripting language and how to interact with APIs, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's get, let's get started here. I'm gonna pause for a, a little drink while you think about that image for a second. Okay. So um, if, you, if you'd like to follow along, you can, you can follow along with this, with this bit. There's actually a little bit of setup that we have to do in Domo before we can get started uh, working with the APIs. <laughs> and so what we're going to do is go to this site, developer.domo.com. Um, that'll be the same for everyone. And that's, that's where you go to, to set up uh, API clients and also for all the API docs and the help docs and everything else that we, that we provide to help you uh, work on that. So you'll notice when you get there that there's a login button in the top right. If you click on that button, you're going to get to uh, this screen, and it's it's asking you to do something here, and uh, I will demo for you what you would do. 
right? So my URL is domo.domo.com. And uh, so I'm just going to put domo in that little box, and I'm going to click go, right? Uh, if you're not logged in, you're going to get a login screen. If you are logged in, you're just going to go right back to, to that site, and um, you'll be able to start working. Um, so what you want to do is you want to set up a new client. So you go up to the My Account button and click this new, new client option. You'll get a screen like this one that's, uh, I think, on your right. And um, there you're going to put in a name and a description, and you're going to, you're going to select what scope you want your new client to have. So this is one of the options that we provide so that you can, you can limit, you can have multiple clients and you can limit what, what each of those clients can do. Um, if you've done any work with APIs, you know that this is relatively standard uh, practice. So once you've set up the client, uh, you can go to the Manage Clients page and you'll just get a list of, of all the clients that you'll, you've set up. And this is what that'll look like. It'll give you the client ID and the client secret and those will be used as your authentication against the API going forward. And they will be tied to your user. So um, you know, as you're interacting with the API, if you go back and look at um, any audit logs or anything, you'll actually see your name, like your user has been doing these things. Um, I bring that up because, um, as you'll learn going through this, like I, this is a high level of anxiety and paranoia in my life. And so if you happen to like create a client for a friend and give that friend your ID and secret, just know that like, if they're not your friend, that's a problem. Um, if you find out that they're not your friend, you can actually delete the client really, really easily, right? And get rid of it. So there is that option. OK, so once, once we have set everything up in Domo, um, then we can go into your, uh, you know, whatever your environment of choice is. Um, here you'll be looking at code that, that comes out of a Jupyter Notebook um, that I've created. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk through this a little bit for you. So you'll see on that first line, the, the, you're importing this library called PyDomo. Uh, there are instructions on the developer site uh, that'll tell you how to install that. Okay, um, I'm also going to use um, pandas fairly liberally because I I just like to I like things to be pretty when I look at them, um, in in my code, and so that's why I'm I'm kind of setting these display options here. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this, but uh, again, referencing anxiety and paranoia, um, I don't want my credentials to show up, let's say, in a GitHub repository somewhere. Um, ever in any of those versions, and so I, I do my best to like keep that stuff in a separate location and don't check it into GitHub, uh, and so that's why they're in this file. It also gives me the ability to um, potentially reuse those credentials across several different different scripts, and then if I need to refresh them, I can I can delete the client and set them all in one spot, right? So um, the the last thing I'm doing here is I'm I'm calling this Domo object and I'm giving it those credentials the the ID and the secret, and this is going to create the object that I'll use then in the, in the future slides to interact with the APIs. Okay, so, so with that, we've done all the setup in the developer site, and we've done all the setup in the code so that we can uh, get things rolling, okay? Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. So what I'm going to do um, from here on out, I'll talk about uh, three different use cases for using the API. And um, just a note is that the resources are, are quite good on the site. So if you go to the, on developer, on the developer site, you can go to resources, and then in the, in the bottom right there, there's the API reference. And you can see an example of what that looks like right there for the user API. And you'll often see in the, in the bottom portion, like below each of the endpoints, we'll outline, we have a link out to some example code. And this is actually how I learned how to use the Python SDKs, just by reading these examples that they've provided. Okay. All right. So the, the first thing I'll go through is something that admittedly you may not actually want to do with the API, which is like just create one user. Um, but I think it's a good way just to illustrate how to, how to get going. So uh, what you'll see is at the top, we're importing a couple of helper objects that have been created. Um, you know, this create user request object will help you to kind of package up that request before you make it so that it, it just makes it a little bit easier. Um, this next block of code is where you do the actual setup. So you're going to give it a, a name and an email address and a role. Those are the three required fields for creating a user. And then 
note there the send invite. So you can tell the endpoint to either send an, send an email to that person or, or you can suppress the email uh, when you're doing it. So which can be, uh, I mean, it's up to you, right? But if you really want to spam like 300 people with, with you've been demoed emails, like super good way to do it. Um, and then here we just create the user. So you call domo.users.create and give it that information. And voila, you've created uh, a new user in Domo. The great thing is you can use the users.list function and then, right, so you create the user and then pull a list of users back out of Domo. And the purpose of this is often just to check to see whether the user was actually created. Heaven forbid we have to like touch our mouse and like log back into Domo, right? I think I warned you that I was lazy. Okay. So the thing that we might really want to do is to create a list, create users based off of a list that we have somewhere. Um, in this case, what I have is a CSV file of users. And um, I just want to, for every row that's in that data set, I want to create one user, right? So I, I have this user defined function, which you'll notice um, on, on there on line six, right? We're using um, an iterator to go through the list that I'm providing, which, which is stored in a data frame. And then for each uh, row, I'm calling that, that users.create uh, function. I've also, the, the other thing that I have a tendency to do in these functions is to have some sort of an output. So you'll notice I, on line five there, I have this users created list, and I'm just appending whatever gets returned from the API into that thing so that I, uh, so I can inspect it maybe later. Um, and then so you'll notice there on, yeah, on line 13, I just call that function, and it creates how many users, you know, whatever I've listed out in that file. Um, it gets it done. And then again, like pull the user list again to, just to see if it worked. So this is cool, but you don't have to use a CSV file, obviously. Um, if, if, you're, if you're an admin in Domo, you know that you can actually do a bulk add in Domo with a CSV file. So maybe it's not terribly useful. But on occasion, what happens is we'll have users that are in some other system, and that system has an API. So why not you know, just do the transfer this way? Um, so on this slide, I get, to, I, I get to give a disclaimer, which is you can really uh, ruin things in your instance by using the APIs. So in other words, if you want to delete all of the users in your instance, like, you can do it super fast. Um, and that's what this function does. I, so I, I define this function, and I'm, I'm just giving it you know, a list of users to not delete, and it will just wipe everything else out. Right? And that's across the board. Like We provide delete functionality for, for many parts of the product. Uh, so handle with care, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, now, if you're like me, you actually, so the, the API has some limiters built into it. So the user list function will pull a maximum of 500 users at a time. But, but if you're like me, you've got more than 500 users in the instance. So you have to hit the endpoint multiple times. Um, and so that's what this function does. Um, let's see. Sorry. Uh, so this function just runs a while loop, so until it stops returning whatever limit I've set, it's going to keep, keep calling the endpoint and uh, pulling users out of the instance. So it can be super helpful, again, if, if you've got more than 500, uh, which is a Domo stockholder. I hope you do. Hope you do you know? Anyway, the joke didn't land. All right. The, um, <laughs> okay, so here's a complete list of, of user API functions. I didn't talk about the last two there, the retrieve user and update user. So the API allows you to retrieve an individual user record, which is going to provide a lot more information than the, than the list function will, right? When you pull a list out of Domo, it's going to give you basic information about those users, but it won't give you things like their phone number or, or um, you know, their title or anything like that. But the retrieve user, any of the profile information that's in there, the retrieve user um, and uh, function will return all of that information, um, including uh, any group memberships that that, that, that user is in. Um, the update user would allow you to update any, any of those properties. So if you wanted to uh, you know, change a batch of email addresses or swap people from one role to another uh, quickly, like all of that's available in the, in the API. And then um, there's also group API, which allows you to, to interact with those groups um, you know, in, a, in a bulk fashion as well. So you can create a group, you can delete a group, you can, you can put a bunch of users in a group, you can take them out. All that stuff is, is possible and, and well documented in our documentations. Okay. 
So if you can't tell, this guy has dropped his shirt out of his room on the second floor, I guess. And it's, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it cracks me up. All right, uh, so we wanna talk through the, the functions available for the page API. So again, like the, the basic functions are, are mostly the same, right? So we can create things and we can modify things and, and, uh, and delete things, right? The interesting thing is like for, on the update pages uh, API, you can actually modify the page name. You can move a page, so you can change it from a parent page to a sub page, or you can move, you know, move it from one sub page to the next sub page, or parent, I guess. Um, and you can rearrange the cards on the page, which is fun. And then you can also interact with collections in the same way. So you can rearrange the cards in the collections and things like that, um, which I think is uh, there, right? And the, the other thing that the page API will do is it will tell you who has access to the page, and it will tell you what cards are on the page and what collections are on the page and what cards are in those collections, right? So if you're like me, every now and then what you'd like to see is just a map of who has access to what in Domo, and the API would allow you to do that. So what I have here, uh, I'm not gonna go line by line through this, so I'll just tell you kind of at a high level what it does. It will, uh, for e so you give it a page ID, and it will query that page and unravel all of the user uh, information on that page, right? So the, the output of this thing will be a data frame that has one row for every card and user that has access to um, that card, right? So it'll, unra it'll even unravel like the group memberships and things like that. Um, so uh, just homework, like if, if you want, you can make it handle subpages. So it's not, like it's not gonna traverse down to any subpages underneath whatever page you gave it. So um, if you got some spare time between now and the show tonight and you wanna do that, then you know, that'd be fun. Um, okay. So last up, uh, data sets and PDP. Um, there's actually two, two relevant data set APIs in Domo. There, there's the main data set API, which will, which will give you back metadata about data sets, and it will let you create an update and, and move them around and things like that. Uh, that API will also help you manage PDP policies. There's a second API for streams, and uh, so that API only handles uploading data into data sets, and it can often be, um, like very often be a lot quicker than uploading data through the other data set API. The trade-off is it's a little harder to work with. It's a little more complicated, um, but sometimes if, if your data gets beyond a certain size, like it, it's, it's a worthwhile upgrade to make uh, to, your, to your scripts, okay? All right, so one thing that, that I find myself doing is uh, creating a, you know, batches of PDP policies that follow some format. So one, one thing that, uh, that I'll often have to do is to create a PDP policy for every email address that's in a column of data, all right? And that's what this function will do. So what I'm doing is I am setting it up so that I, can, I give it uh, user's information, which would include their user ID and their email address. I'm gonna tell it the email column that I'm gonna use. So in this case, it's creatively called PDP email. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it like a list of additional filters. And I'll, I'll get to that here uh, in the next couple slides. So you can see here, uh, the, the first little bit is I'm using this policy filter um, object that, that's provided through the SDK that helps me to set up this filter. You can see I'm giving it, I'm telling it the email column that I'm using and then uh, telling it I wanna use the equals operator and then giving it the user, the, uh, the email address, right? So here I've set up this filter um, this is where I add in any additional filters that I want to add onto the policy. And then here I'm actually creating this policy using that, that policy object that you see there on line 13. So all this function does is I give it the user's info, the, the column that I want to use, the additional filters, and it returns a policy object. So it doesn't actually add the policy to the data set yet. Um, yeah, one, one other comment is I need the user ID um, because that, that's obviously that's how the users are specified in the system. And you can get that from the, right, you can call the list users um, function to get that. So, um, 
Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. And again, when you when you um, you can ask Domo to give you those user IDs, right? So you can use that user list function in the SDK, and it'll it'll give you all the IDs back. Yes. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Good question. Uh, okay. Good. No. Yeah, OK. I'm just going to keep rolling, guys. All right. So here we go. So here I'm setting up this extra filter. And, and uh, I like doing this. So, so you can see like it's called scorecard instance. And I'll talk more about this kind of at the tail end. But I, I manage this uh, page of, of cards for our sales and CS group. And there, there are occasions where I want to I want to PDP that page down to the individual uh, person, but I might also want to separately control visibility for uh, any individual row of data. But I don't want to have to mess with their PDP in order to do that. So I have this extra column that's just a one or a zero. And so if, if, uh, if for some reason I want to hide a row of data, I can just flip that to zero and it'll turn it off. And, and so because I'm using it that way, I want that filter added to, to the PDP policies that I'm creating. So I'm going to create one policy for each email address, but I'm going to kind of add this other filter into that um, policy at the same time. So that, that's what that's doing. Um, next, I would just set up, you know, I go get the data set ID. Um, the data set ID is in the URL of the, of the actual data set, so that's where you get that. And then you'll notice I'm pulling that list of all the users. And then last, I'm going to run that, the, the function that we saw earlier, I'm going to run that in a loop, and it's going to create this whole batch of policies. So this is a great way to create, you know, it'll create several hundred policies in, in a couple of seconds, really. Um, yeah, and just one comment, like the, you can see this call to create underscore PDP. That's the function that actually creates that policy. Okay. Um, again, if for some reason you need to clear the PDP policies, super easy. Um, this is actually a lot less dangerous than deleting users, right? If you delete a, a PDP policy, it's just not a big deal. Like your content's not going to go away, or something. You know, you're not going to create a situation where you've orphaned a ton of cards or anything like that, right? Um, so here you can see, like, I can pull, I can use this list PDPs function to get an actual list of all the PDPs, and then just run through that list and delete them all. There's also a way to toggle PDP on and off, you'll see on that last row. So if you want to, you know, if you have a list of data sets you want to switch it on for, you just run this function and switch them all on all at once. Another fun thing to do is if you need to mirror PDP between two different data sets, you can use the APIs to just pull all of the policies and then copy them all to some other data set. So in this case, you know, we, we just got finished creating a bunch of policies on one data set. Here we can pull those policies and then just simply copy them over to two, uh, to two other uh, data sets. Hopefully that made sense. OK. So um, now I'm going to explain uh, how I use this, um, because I have a script uh, that runs uh, about 8 o'clock every night, and it interacts with this page in Domo. So it's called the Health Scorecard. The, um, the Health Scorecard uh, tracks a bunch of statistics about usage uh, on the instances. It tracks um, you know, purchase history for our customers and a whole just suite of information. You can see like there's 41 cards on that page and 22 data flows. And you get a fair amount of usage. So nearly 400 users have access to it. And probably you know, nearly half of them are using it on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can see there uh, just over 7,000 policies across those 22 data flows. And um, you know, if you think back to the uh, economics of, of laziness slide, like this is, we're really hitting like square in the automation uh, quadrant of that chart, right? Um, because if somebody leaves the company or, or if somebody should move positions or anything like that, like I don't want to have to do any of that stuff. Because believe me, I did it for a while and it was super boring. Um, so again, I have, this, uh, I have this script that runs every night. Uh, it, there's a base data set that I use that defines all of the primary, all of the, the ideal set of policies. 
And so I scan that data set, I create these policies, and then any net new policies that need to be created, I just create those, right? So I don't, I'm, I'm not in a situation where I'm just wiping policies and then creating them again. Like I actually just wanna, I wanna leave uh, well enough alone most of the time. The other thing I do is I scan the policies twice to do deletions. So if a policy has no users in it, um, that, and that happens often when somebody leaves the company, their user account will be deleted, and that policy will just be hanging out there. So I can scrub those. And then I actually run each policy and figure out whether it still returns data. And if it doesn't, then I, I'll delete those as well, right? Um, and that happens if somebody moves departments or something and their policy uh, becomes invalid. Um, the other thing that I really like, th this gives me a lot of joy, what I'm about to tell you. I manage um, temporary policies, and a temporary policy, so this happens sometimes because somebody will need um, expanded access, so let's say they come to me and they say, hey, I'm, you know, we, we have a, a sales consultant or something, and they say, hey, I've been asked by my manager to do this project to find out this thing, so I need access to, to all, you know, say, corporate uh, sales, right? So what I can do is I can add a policy to each of those 22 data sets. The, the name of the policy follows a specific format. So it says temp, and then a date, and then a name. So what I can do is I can, every night I can check all of those temp policies, and if 45 days has passed, then I just delete the policy, right? So I don't have to remember to go scrub you know, access from anyone. Um, it also gives me a good indication of who's actually uh, using that new access because if they never come back to me, like they probably <laughs> never actually looked at it. Um, but sometimes they'll go, they'll go, hey, my access went away, and I don't know why. And I go, I know why. Um, anyway, and lastly, um, I can use that group, a, the, the groups functionality to just scrape the data set for all of the users that need to have access and then add them to a group. Um, and that way I don't, I don't have to manage that either. So if, if we hire, let's say we hired a new account executive, um, as soon as they're, uh, assigned accounts in Salesforce, the, those account ownerships will, will come into Domo, and then this thing will run, and it will grant them access to this page automatically. Okay. All right, so that's the content I've prepared. Um, one thing is I, I did post the, the, all the code that you saw is in a Jupyter notebook. Um, I posted that to Domo's public uh, Git repo, so you can all, uh, go there and get all the code. There's a little bit of bonus content because I show you how to create a data set and then fill the data set with, with data um, kind of at the bottom of that notebook, okay? So I think Mark has the mic. Yeah, so if you wanna clap th uh, three times for every picture you took. <laughs> yeah, it worked, it worked all right. I'll run the mic for Jeremy, thanks Jeremy. You're oh, welcome. Hello, hello again. Quick question, um, do you have a function to transfer the card ownership when the employee leaves the company? Like for example, right now I have to change it one by one, but right. can we do it in bulk? So the public API does not currently allow any functions for, for cards like that. So I guess the answer would be no. No right now, I guess. Yeah, so you can manage it in bulk if you're an admin. Oh, that's um, in right. The admin pain. So, just yes. so you know. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, Jeremy's a, not an admin. <laughs> Actually, Jeremy is a. Actually, admin. I'm a little embarrassed to say, but I don't like I don't admin the instance. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm no, just. I, I might worry about it. I'm so. just trying to belittle him so he doesn't overpower me. <laughs> right. Uh, you mentioned a lot that you were doing the PDPs by email address. And then at the end, you said you sometimes do it by group. I, I'm a bit surprised that it's not always by group, or maybe mm -hmm. I misunderstood how you're managing, right. adding, you know, do you kind of, how do you choose what PDPs apply to a new hire, for example? Right, so I ha what I have is, I, that's all driven by the data. So I have a column that represents the account representative assigned to that account. And so for every distinct value in that column, I'll create a new PDP policy. So if, if, a, new, if a new account rep comes online, then their, their email address will all of a sudden show up in that column, and then the script will pick that up and create the PDP policy for them. Okay. Does that make sense? So, and then I have a column for their manager and their manager's manager and, 
and so on. And then another set of columns for like the CSMs and so forth. Oh yeah, so you've got like a hierarchy set up. And That's that right. Powers it. Okay, yeah, That's that right. Sense. Thanks. So uh, you talked about the uh, Salesforce uh, setup where you had a particular lo a role where, um, and you had an API that would actually look up the role and um, you know run overnight. Um, is there a way to expand that to uh, maybe a LDAP setup, um, like a Active Directory lookup for all these different um, you know categories of mm -hmm. um, you know when new employees join or look up in um, Okta for like a group setup and then uh, right. filter that over. Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't, I don't know exactly because I don't, I don't interact with those um, systems. But if you can get the data into Domo, um, like, like I've pulled our user list from Salesforce into Domo, and then for each account, we have the account ownerships, which I've pulled into Domo. And then, I, and then I work all of that out and put it on the data set. And once you have it on the data set, then you can use these methods to, to create all of those policies. So, so you mean like pull out the CSVs on groups and all the other role attributes right. over and then run the API yeah. from there? Yeah, I mean, okay. ide ideally what would happen is you'd have a, a connector to that system where you could pull it in. Yep. Um, the other thing, like we saw the, the new functionality that we announced today with the dynamic PDP and things like that. The, I mean, and then, you know, we do have SSO integrations and things of that nature. So it's possible that, that some of this you can do just with native product functionality, especially going forward as those product as those uh, features are released. Okay. Does that and, make sense? Yep, that makes yeah. sense. Okay. And the other question around the uh, health scorecard. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something like an app that we can um, use uh, in Domo already built somewhere? Um, can we access that? <laughs> <laughs> no, not right now. Okay. Um, I do know, so, so I make it available, obviously, for our users. We also have the, um, uh, the Domo stats data sets, which would, which would provide some of that information to you. So you can use Domo stats to pull user lists and to pull, um, uh, I, don't, I don't work with it a lot, so I don't know totally what's in it, uh, but, but some of that information is available to you through that Domo stats framework. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm staring at this side. Of, I've learned that the left side of the room apparently never asks questions. Yeah, I saw. I thought I saw him oh, okay. earlier. All right. Yeah. Go first. Um, I have a question. Do you guys have any plans to um, like add some functionality to your export API? Um, I know that this was all about like kind of like APIs within Domo, but what mm -hmm. about like pulling your data out of Domo again? Right, so there is an API to export data, um, and it just it pulls the entire data set down. Yeah. But with right? filters and like a little bit m more sophisticated. Yes, so um, I like that question, because I want it too. Nice, we really yeah. want it, so yeah. I, that's why I'm asking it, even though I've asked like 100 times. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> yes. Uh, believe me, I, I ask for the same thing on a regular basis, because yeah, it would be nice to be able to, e like, my preference would be to send a SQL statement up and then get some data back. Um, I don't know if that's how you feel about it, but that, that's kind of where I go. Something that. that we saw today in the presentation was something about like, I don't, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was like, obviously there are connectors into Domo, like from AWS, but it seemed like almost like there was a connector to be out and something that they, that, um, Josh had said was that like they don't want to have vendor lock-in so mm -hmm. I was wondering like whether um, there were some sort of like connectors out that are kind of like an export API. Yes yeah, so I think I, I believe we do have those in fact I think there's there's even like an S3 right back connector. That's so I you know cool. if, if I were you just go to the to the Domo booth in there and, and ask those guys and they'll know. Awesome thank you. Yeah. I was just going to ask, you were mentioning the Domo Stats framework. Mm -hmm. Is that where we can expose like metadata about the pages and the cards and usage and things like that? So I think so. I'm, I'm not sure of all the options under, under Domo Stats, but um, it's like activity. yeah, the, that, that's just metadata. Yeah, someone else wants to answer my question, so yeah. Perfectly happy to have that happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so a couple of things. So on the um, metadata, yeah, there's a ton of information. If you enable that uh, quick start, then you'll have a data set that you can pull down that will tell you 
lots of granular detail about usage, about size of your data sets, and on down the list. But yeah. on the uh, question you had about being able to pull that data down like a filtered list, if the data set is too big, like I would want all of it like in my data warehouse and then filter from there. But if it's so big, you could create a data flow for your purposes that would create an output data set that's tailored and maybe smaller. And that would have a UUID, you know, and so your the endpoint for the data set API, you could pull all the data sets that you've got and then you'll have knowledge of everything that's in there. And then you'll have, you can also hit the column API data set that would tell you about the type of data which, that's in there. And then you can transform that into your data warehouse if that's making sense. But if you use a naming convention like, you know, Jane's special output, then you could just cherry pick those and land those in like a SQL database if that's making sense. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah, and I've, I've done that too uh, on occasion. Just pre-process the data um, b before you pull it out. Uh, I have a question, but I also have an answer to <laughs> what Great. was being said over there. Um, I'm pretty sure this is standard across all companies, not just ours. Domo has a activity data set feed that actually tells you like everything that's going on with your data sets and your users. So how many people are looking at reports built by a specific user? Um, how many reports that person has built, uh, when it was created, and we use it a lot to measure who our like, top Domo performers are. So mm -hmm. if you want to get metadata about things that you create, you can go to that activity log data set. Yeah. And my question was, um, there, like two months ago or so, Domo released um, like a hidden tab that was always there, but nobody could see it, which is the history tab on the data set. Um, and also there's another hidden feature that you can only access by a special hash hashtag, which is the data repair functionality. Mm -hmm. um, are those available to export via the API? Um, because we have users that make constant changes to data sets, right? So mm -hmm. they change the versionings and things like that. And uh, being able to track like the, how many changes are being done on data sets can allow us to know like how stable they are. Yeah. So using the APIs that you mentioned, is that something that can be exported so I can see how many changes have been done mm -hmm. um, based on history and failures or when a specific data version has been deleted? Yeah, so to my knowledge that there are no endpoints in the public APIs for that. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so he's saying like, yeah. Yes, sir. That's okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. No, I'll just keep standing. You're, you're a little <clears throat> persistent. A little? <laughs> um, I was just saying that the, uh, the certifications for the data sets should be able to handle that process flow because every time after you've certified a data set, every time a change is made to it, it's going to go back through that workflow that you've set up for it. Right. Yeah, it'll have to be recertified if it's modified for sure. Yeah, if you, you ask questions about secret tabs, uh, you, no one will see this guy tomorrow. So, just <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Go ahead. I was curious. Um, can you create transformations through the API? So, if we we know all the steps and we want to provision that, mm -hmm. can you can you do that through the API? So, n the not through the public APIs, not through the ones we yeah discussed. That's correct. Not through the public ones. That's correct. Yeah. Got it. That's the last question we're going to take. Don't push it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, one more round of applause for Jeremy. Thanks so much, All Jeremy. Right. Thank you.